All right. Thank you all for coming. I see people from different backgrounds, different organizations as well, students, non-students as well. Um, my name is Emilio Guzman. I will be your host tonight. Um, welcome all to today's event, which is called Common Attack, Countering Foreign Influence on LGBT, Anti-LGBTQ and Women's Rights in the Face of Democratic Erosion. Um, today's event is a co-organization, or it's, it was made possible because of Urgent Foundation, Shelter City Program, uh, UVA Pride as well, and Save Amsterdam, uh, the student organization of the United Nations. Um, and I will be doing the introduction and the moderation of the event. Um, today we'll be talking about, uh, we will discuss the threat from transnational conservative networks as an intersectional issue on LGBT, LGBTQI and women's rights emphasizing contemporary LGBTQI uh, and women's rights in Latin America and Europe, um, and the promotion of an anti-rights, anti especially anti-LGBTQI agenda by transnational conservative networks, um, and making some parallels between populist movements and the democratic erosion in Latin America and in Europe. Um, before we start, uh, I want to introduce today's speakers, First, we have Ivan Chanis Barona. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, he's a human rights lawyer from Panama and is the president of Fundación Iguales, uh, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to the promotion of human rights, uh, equality and diversity in society, and also democratic values as well. He has ample experience as national and international human rights advocacy, um, with a strong emphasis on LGBTQI, LGBTQI rights issues, uh, as well as previous experience in the Supreme Court of Panama and the UN system, and is a former diplomat uh, and legal counselor, and he has served as an active member in the Advisory Council of the, United, uh, of the National Mechanism for the Prevention of Torture, and he is a co-writer or co-signature of multiple um, Latin American conventions on human rights. He will talk to them uh, about them in a bit. We also have Evi van den Dugan from uh, Rutgers. Uh, he, she's a senior advisor of, of global advocacy at Rutgers. Um, she advocates for sexual and reproductive health and rights in the UN, in, the, in New York and Geneva. She's involved in the programmatic work of Rutgers, working with activists in, in Africa and Asia, to whom she provides support on global advocacy and human rights mechanism. She uses to work, uh, she used to work in Dutch and European politics and completed an, a master in law in international, in international security. And then we also have Shamla Tsaragat. Sorry for the mispronunciation. She holds a degree in public and, uh, international law and human rights and social sciences in management and is international project manager at COC uh, Netherlands. She's responsible for the partnerships in Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and Indonesia, and oversees COC's program in implementation, capacity de development, and participatory grant-making process in Indonesia, and the grant-making in Central Asia, and supporting over 30 partners. Um, we also have a special guest tonight from uh, an Armenian delegation, which will uh, take the mic uh, later to discuss a little bit more about the situation of LGBT, LGBTQ rights in Armenia as well. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, I will give the floor to Ivan, who will talk a little bit more about LGBTQ rights issues in Latin America and in Panama especially. So give, a, give him a clap. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you, Emilio, for that kind introduction. and for your hard work on the organization of this night and congratulations for accomplishing uh, a long time of you during your internship uh, uh, that concretes today with this amazing event. Thank you so much for your service also while I'm here. Um, as you know, I'm Ivan, I don't have slides. <laughs> um, technical issues, but we're good. Uh, bear bear uh, with me. Um, I, I think, well, suggested by Emilio, I will start giving like a brief commentary of 
LGBT rights and the problems facing in Latin America and Panama, just to set the tone of maybe on the more deep issues I want to discuss later. Uh, I don't know how, mo how like, what is the level of knowledge of you about a country like Panama or a specific issue or niche like LGBT rights in, in Latin America. So I'm, I'm, I, 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 I will start with that uh, and I hope uh, you will appreciate having that introduction. And then I will be happy to expand if, if anything of what I said is not clear or it creates more, more questions. So I think for us in Latin America, um, it's, it's kind of a, a situation of contrast. You know, if you, uh, a fair thing to say um, is that Latin America has been one of the region, of the region that have changed more dramatically in the recognition of rights for LGBT persons in the last decade or so. Though, at the same time, Latin America still is the more dangerous country, the, the most regional region, to be an LGBTQ plus person. In, if, if we use data of people assassinated for, because of being LGBTQ plus, or specifically a trans person, or in, in the case of trans women, Brazil is the more dangerous place on earth by a statistic, second Mexico. But it's also a level, uh, an issue of violence generally in, in those countries or to minorities or some level of poverty. But by those statistics, we can, we can start with this idea that is a huge contrast of decades of rights recognition and progression and then still persistent violence. So uh, I could go long before, but I'm going to set a timeline from 2010. So 2010 is a very important year because Argentina legalized civil marriage for a uh, same-sex couple. This is, this is a landmark. It's one of the first countries in the world. Well, this country is the first, but Argentina is not that far um, in, in line. Uh, back then, Canada and Argentina only had it in the Americas. Today, that's different. Um, Another important time, I'm going to jump to 2017, just to set a, a legal important moment, is that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights also decide, in advisory opinion 24, that the law of the land in includes the recognition of marriage and uh, the right of identity. So trans rights and the rights of changing the name and birth um, and sex market in their birth certificate or a passport or legal documents. And, and why is that? And, and that happened because there was a vast group of countries that legalized these issues, but others that lagged behind. Um, and that actually then uh, continues my, my initial commentary that we are a uh, region of contrast, right? Territories that have same-sex uh, marriage, Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, Cuba, and if we add Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, but also part of the United States, but you know, that's another story. Uh, and the dependent territories of the French, Guyana, and uh, Malvinas, the Isla Malvina or Falcon Islands. Uh, as in English, and recently Bolivia approved uh, civil unions and, and, and didn't prohibit marriage to open, open the door for another South American country for marriage. Important, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Mexico even have constitutional protections for discrimination for sexual orientation and gender identity, which is incredible. Like these countries even went further to, you know, change their constitutions to include a specific protection, a specific recognition of rights to LGBT persons. Remember what I said in Mexico before. So, you know, do the parallelisms of, of those, those ideas. Um, so our legal advances equivalent to cultural change? In, in, some, in some moments in time it is. In this case, we can have a long, profound philosophical debate. That is not the case. No. Still with these changes, there's lots of prejudice still in our societies uh, because of the conservative roots that are based, uh, especially Latin American countries. We can add the, the twist of religion, 
um, some um, lack of, of education and other problems that are more, you know, impo quote unquote, important for a society who lacks development, equality, um, uh, and, and other social issues that are more difficult to comprehend. So it, it, it is interesting to see that around 70% of the people who live in territories in Latin America live in a country where civil marriage is the law. Why, and how, how, why is that big? Of course, countries by population, by countries like Mexico, Argentina, um, Colombia, that are huge populations, that makes us 76%. But having said that, I just mentioned the countries who have um, uh, civil marriage, but if we, were, if we count Latin America, we're 35 countries. And if we add the twist of studying the Caribbean, we still have criminalization of sexual orientation and identity in places like Jamaica, where I personally have to once help a, a gay couple that was escaping from Jamaica because they tried to burn them inside their house. The police didn't defend them. They have to escape through the help of diplomatic immunity. I, I, I'm pretty sure the Dutch were involved, but I'm pretty sure the, the, the um, Germany was leading that operation. And they left Jamaica, sent it to Mexico through Panama. And when they're do, going through Panama, Mexico sent a, a notice that they will not be welcome. Therefore, Panama was retaining them to send them to their final destination, which is illegal by international law. Some of you know that. Um, so that this is this is still happens in our in, in Latin America or in the Americas. It's not uh, it's not um, uh, uncommon to uh, for LGBT peoples to suffer physical violence. There's still lots of of documentation by the Inter American Commission of Human Rights of uh, rape correction, for example, to lesbian women that are raped by family members or members of their community just to make them like sex with a man. Um, so uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, the, in the legal perspective of, of some good, like recent developments, we have two different cases from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. One is Vicky Hernandez versus Honduras, it's from 2021. Basically, uh, Honduras was uh, found guilty on non-protecting a trans woman that was killed during the coup d'etat and several other women, but the, the case based on one single trans woman. And the inter interesting is that the, the court not only recognized that the state didn't have the due care of protecting a trans woman, but that states in the Americas have a higher responsibility to protect trans women because they're only women, but because they're also trans. So it's a higher level of protection that the court have set. Uh, this is recent, let's see in implementation how it goes. You know the problem, one thing is the policy and one thing is implementation, but at least we're sending a message that this is the right approach to the protection of trans women. And the most recent one about LGBT rights is Olivera Fuentes versus Peru. It is a very interesting case because it's the first time that the court not only found um, a state guilty by not having uh, enough protections to protect for sexual orientation, but said the state is also responsible by not having the policies to protect those that, that minority even in private spaces. It was a gay couple who was harassed, um, kicked out by, um, by security uh, personnel from a private mall where they were having lunch. Um, and the, the fact that every single um, authority there will present their case, it was refused, not even recognized um, the right to be heard having a case, and, and the Inter-American Court decided that, and that's, um, that, that, that's, that's a recent landmark. This is from 2023. A, a little bit about Panama. I, I, I think Panama is like a bridge to the world and at the same time a setback for human rights. Um, I was involved 
personally and as a lawyer in a case for the past seven years, uh, the case of marriage equality, which we lost this year. Um, so Panama and Suriname uh, are the only two countries in the Western Hemisphere at the moment that have said no to equal marriage at the constitutional court or the highest court. Of course, all other countries have said no in lower courts, but we, 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 are, we have that star or the bad star in, in our batch of <laughs> not doing the right things. Um, and and uh, I guess the, this falls into uh, the question of, of what is missing or what is next in terms of the work of people like me or some of the interests of people like you because you're here is that um, there's still uh, huge problems that have not been discussed or not discussed enough. In my, in my personal opinion, one issue that is very important is conversion practices or conversion therapy because that involves not only to, to sustain and maintain the prejudice that sexual orientation, like uh, uh, that, uh, the very sexual orientation that a heteronormative one or uh, an identity that is only a binary one uh, is something wrong and is something that should be uh, curated or fixed. And that involves also the, the regulation of the, the professionals that work in the access to health, the legal, the legal and um, and health system of different countries. So it's a, it's a, I think it's an issue that is very intersectional, that should be addressed, and it's actually becoming more of the interest of activists and, and, and people related to policy on LGBT rights. Um, political participation is still uh, very difficult in Latin America. Um, the importance of normalizing the lives of queer persons is really important. And we know that leadership, and I, I'm talking most, more broadly, not only about political one, which is the, the one that I, I, I look for the most, but even the private aspect of private leadership, you know, CEOs, CFOs, like open LGBT persons, there's still so much stigma that e even people in position of power and then the, the coercion that comes sometimes when these people are in position of power from conservative groups that lead these uh, leaderships to a more conservative one, them to protect them not being out. And, you know, off the record, I could tell you examples of even presidents at the moment in Latin America who people know that they are homosexuals or they have even a partner, but if it's okay if they don't say that, and then they're mostly aligned with the conservative, with the evangelicals, with the Catholic Church, because they don't want to pay the price of being out and then being in a position of leadership. So that tells a lot of, of things to come, and uh, I think it's a very difficult uh, situation. There, there's some leadership. Um, there, we have a, a trans uh, members of Congress in Colombia for many years, in Brazil as well, um, recently in Guatemala, uh, but those are like we, we can we can we can pin them. It's not like like a narrative of, of acceptance of political parties or uh, political atmospheres towards uh, the representation or um, the presence of LGBTI persons. Um, and 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 to me also one of the 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 uh, the, the more delicate issues related to all the one, the one that I mentioned before, to conversion therapies, is the lack of access uh, of trans people to the right health. And that encompasses, it's a very broad, you know, from the access to mental health to the right for them to have proper um, the physicians or of, of, of um, access to um, to a proper medicine in the process of their transition, moreover the respect on the treatment of those in the in the in the in the in the system of, of health. Because for example I, I speak from the Panamanian experience, I work closely with with uh, the trans community and for example there are there is like two hospitals in the country that w will receive them and give them the treatment that they need for the transition. 
and they need to travel long hours, not even have money for transportation. Then you come there and then you could be received or not by the nurse or by the person. So that deters some from access, going to that, to have that access, that right that they have. We have a, um, um, a public system where they have the right to, to receive health. Um, and then the impact that that ha could have in their life. Once you start transitioning, I don't know if you uh, uh, know about this, but it's very dangerous to just stop the transition for many reasons, biologically and mentally. So you need a, 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 a person who knows about this to take care of you in all the phases of your transition. And when you are not received, discriminated, or, or even that you know you receive bad treatment and you leave that system you start like hormonizing yourself or taking um, uh, med like medicines by yourself you can actually put your life in risk and this is uh, a very unfair you know on on top of facing violence um, on the streets um, lack of uh, access to education most of the time then um, uh, not even having the right of their own self-expression and and the process of it, I think is is a is a pending issue um, that we should all discuss. So many things that we can do from the personal, from the work, and the political spaces. You know, um, as an individual, of course, of course, showing up here and getting information of it is just a way to support, but you know, talking in, in small circles as big circles of the importance of respecting LGBTQ plus persons in our workspaces to be sensitive towards who works with you, what is their need, just being curious or respectful or how they feel, uh, if they feel integrated or respected is also a way to help. And politically, of course, you know, voting for the right candidates, but that's a sensitive issue these days. So I will stop my presentation and I will dig in after other introductions on more um, specific issues of the conservative and how they're trying to stop the work that we do on LGBT rights. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, now uh, it's the turn of Shamla from COC. She will give a more like a broader uh, respect of LGBTQ rights issues here in, the, in, in Europe, so we can construct it with Ivan's uh, comments on, on Latin America as well. So, Shamla, please. Can you even see me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan, for this overview. I think that it's echoing greatly uh, region uh, I work in. Well, basically, I work for uh, SUC Netherlands, as, as, as already was said, and we have, you know, uh, a national branch and international branch. It's not even branch; it's the same office, but we have, uh, you know, programs that would work outside of the Netherlands, and we work uh, in about 30 countries outside of the Netherlands. And our theory of change is based on, uh, you know, six pathways. First one is empowering individual uh, LGBTI, um, uh, LGBTIQ plus uh, uh, community members, empowering CBOs, uh, that provides space for empowerment for the individuals, empowering the movement, like bringing alliance, uh, alliance and uh, um, creating common space for uh, the CBOs at the national level to be able to address uh, the rights of the uh, LGBTI people at the national uh, level, uh, advocate internationally, and basically uh, follow up on the policy changes uh, that were possible till recent, recent uh, uh, near past. Uh, but unfortunately, our work is getting very, very difficult. And uh, I focus on in Europe. And when we say Europe, you know, Europe is huge, it's super diverse. And in Council of Europe, I think as for now, there are 46 countries. So it's not just our this Schengen bubble or EU bubble that we are more or less, you know, uh, f having idea of. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's countries like uh, 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 that are like based in Caucasus, 
uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, uh, Chechnya, because it's also a part of uh, Russia, uh, and uh, you know, and many more where you have very, very uh, interesting like cultural, religious, uh, social dynamics that leave very little space for female and also and all, as well as for uh, LGBT community. Um, I will also probably try to look at the timeline of like the last, say, uh, 11 years, when like in 2013, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, sort of a trendsetter uh, with regards to policy and uh, um, foreign relationships in the region, which is Russia, uh, did adopt its foreign agent law, uh, basically with an idea of uh, shedding up all the alternative uh, media outlets, um, organizations such as, for example, Memorial, which has a huge history of uh, basically communicating the situations of the humans in the country to the wider uh, public, uh, and in this way, uh, create like you know, um, trying to limit also the space for development of uh, the civil society. For example, when we we are very much, you know, we do speak a lot about civil society, its role, etc. But uh, what it really is, and who are those active members of society, and in which way they are active, is very difficult, uh, like all, all very diverse also, because it's very much related to the cultural background, to uh, history, and uh, nobody is, you know, actually addressing uh, Russian colonialism uh, as a colonialism. It's basically seen in a region, in countries like uh, uh, Central Asian countries like Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Turkmenistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, as um, power that brought um, healthcare system, uh, heating system, etc. And therefore, whatever values or whatever uh, um, policies come from there, they are welcomed because they do trust on it and they do believe to a large extent, I mean, uh, especially older generation of people to, uh, to, 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 to the good of these causes. To make it a bit more, a bit more uh, to the ground and to the rights of uh, LGBTI um, people, I, I want to, you know, uh, refer to the um, tattoo. Remember those two ladies that won Eurovision, uh, that were kissing on TV, which were, they were, you know, openly a uh, lesbian couple, um, and one of them at this point is a member to the Russian ruling party. Uh, so imagine the level of brainwash and, and all the other resources invested into converting people like that to the supporters of current government that is basically uh, proclaiming um, the entire LGBT community worldwide extremists. I'll get to that point a bit, uh, a bit later. And I also want to uh, bring your attention to the situation of um, 2014 when... Uh, uh, Crimea was occupied and parts of Ukraine were occupied. Basically, uh, we did lost at that point communication with the community members and organizations in the occupied territories because they basically did stop uh, start existing um, because of fear. So, like the entire community went back to underground, uh, and one of the main basically control. Um, tools uh, back then we were that they would just you know uh, stop people live looking differently uh, or or queer at the streets and dress them fully and check if they have any identification marks on their bodies such as tattoos or other you know uh, attributes to the uh, to, to the community and there was a number of cases where people were just left on the street uh, naked abused etc because of their association with community um, and that was super painful and it was spreading fear so basically the same thing more or less happened with Belarusian regime after all these events of 2020 uh, or was it 2022 nay 2020 uh, where after the uh, revolution um, all the civils were like forced to shut down 
we did lose the entire connection with uh, the movement in the country because many went into exile, did find, uh, did search for refugee elsewhere, and uh, unfortunately, to this very point, we we cannot support. Uh, not only us, I mean, you know, the entire other, <laughs> our sister organization or, or world do not, does not really have an idea of how is it to be li like at this point um, in, in Belarus. Um, well, Ukraine was the last, uh, the last sort of a hope or, or, or set of, uh, or a country that would set a little bit of alternative tre uh, trends by, by being more democratic and accepting. But then it was very temporary, and it did not allow the civil society or the you know community uh, society at large to get um, more synthesized, etc. Because they, they they did left no time for that, and unfortunately, even now in Ukraine we do hear and face uh, uh, a ridiculous um, attitudes towards community members especially towards trans women that are still uh, called to, uh, uh, to to join the army, etc. Uh, it is not popular message actually to communicate for many reasons, but for uh, the community in Ukraine, it is absolutely challenging to go through all these procedures, etc. That was Ivan also mentioning to get their um, clearance from a ser service. And in many instances, it is not possible. Um, in countries like you know Central Asian countries, which were always dependent financially and still are on 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 uh, the Russian Federation, then the narrative is basically all the time copied. Uh, when it comes to civil society organizations, when it comes to LGBTI uh, uh, people, women rights, etc., and the famous uh, foreign agent law was also implemented in some of those countries, uh, and at this point. Uh, even in Kyrgyzstan, which has been seen even like three years ago, or two years ago, uh, as a hope spot for uh, Central Asia, where people could uh, access uh, the adequate health care, which was not possible after uh, the... Um, uh, due to COVID, etc., and because the way... Uh, the, the, the migration road to uh, Russia or illegal or undocumented crossings were, became even more difficult. Uh, you know, like uh, when we speak about all these things, they might sound like some kind of a story from different universe. But in places like Central Asia, being a community member means that you are to a large extent subjected to exclusion and cut off for whatever financial means by your family. Uh, most probably also an uh, institution where, where you, you, you study or work. So these community centers or ability uh, to be able to communicate with the community is super, super crucial. And what is happening right now is that um, in Kyrgyzstan, as of now, one of the two uh, largest uh, uh, and, and most sort of a prominent organizations that would also help other uh, organizations in the region are shutting down because the newly uh, almost adopted foreign law agent, uh, foreign law foreign agent law is foreseeing uh, up to 10 years uh, in prison for um, LGBTI propaganda um, and all these trends are you know um, very uh, alarming and not only because the community like not only because we had this f sort of five years of uh, prosperity and ability to help to build the community advocate create international spaces bring the voices uh, try to influence uh, from outside it in the international spaces etc but because um, one of the countries in the region, for example, uh, which is uh, Turkmenistan, is fully closed. We have no idea and we had never a clue of how is the community doing in there. Uh, because according to their official position, there are no LGBT people in the country. They are too good to be queer. Uh, in, Kyrgyzstan, in Uzbekistan, um, uh, like uh, same sex sex uh, is uh, like basically gay sex is still uh, criminalized and and there is a lot of uh, um, 
advocacy happening around, around the cream, but the hope are, are very little because because of the economic situation and because of the um, you know um, common shared post uh, Soviet uh, history and Soviet history. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's very sad, and when we say um, uh, erosion of uh, democracy, it, it's just happening, and we can see it happening, uh, not only in the EU, and not only in um, Europe, but elsewhere. In uh, most um, this discouraging uh, uh, situation, especially for me, for like, personally for me, is that these new trends are so powerful. For example, this whole story with the um, criminaliza criminalization of the entire LGBT movement and individuals and organizations, uh, which is legally adopted law in, uh, in, in, in Russia, which is absolutely a genius story because now all the other countries did not really need to bother with foreign agent law. They have the target. They just like come out with this very same legislation. They put it on paper, and the next day you have entire whatever LGBTI activity in your country criminalized. Um, yeah. Well, and I don't know. <laughs> I could go for another maybe half an hour, but I want to maybe finish at this point by saying that though it is all very, very, very uh, pathetic, I think that um, I remember the story of Russia in 2014 uh, and its being expelled from um, parliamentary assembly of the European Union. Uh, there were different views, like, yes, we fully we, we need to cut them off and uh, deny the space. But I believe vice versa, and I'm very happy that they were not actually uh, excluded in a way that to, <laughs> to leave that little hope to individuals and space, uh, individual community members and organizations uh, and LGBT movement in those um, hostile environments, uh, we need to have those spaces open for them to bring their voices and to be able to communicate it with the external wor world. And then we need to encourage the external world to communicate the human rights agenda uh, via businesses, via international pressure, uh, advocacy, etc., uh, to try to still find um, solutions. Thank you very much. Um, and I. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shamla. It was definitely insightful. It's uh, definitely a region that most of us maybe don't know that much about. So definitely thank you so much for giving us maybe a bleak uh, overview of, of, of the situation in, in Central Asia, but also in the Caucasus region. Um, we will talk about the Caucasus a little bit later. Um, but now, I mean, we're talking about LGBTQ rights issues, but th 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 there are actually human rights issues, but we know that human rights is not only about women rights, it's not only about uh, LGBTQ rights I issues separately. We need to, to, to think about uh, human rights in an intersectional way, and that is why we now have Evie from Rutgers, who will give us a little bit more of this intersectional approach of women's rights also, as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, for having me here today. So I'm Avi, I work at Rutgers, which is the uh, Knowledge Center on Sexuality in the Netherlands, based in Utrecht. And um, my role is doing all the global advocacy at the UN in New York and Geneva. And when I explain this to my friends or family, I mostly say I know a little bit like where to put the dots and the commas in a resolution text at the UN. And it's kind of boring and often takes place in a basement. Um, and I often also suffer from uh, imposter syndrome, like what am I doing in this big building in New York? Um, but um, I think it's very important to um, do the nitty gritty work um, in this sometimes hostile world. Um, and I hope I can show my slides, but um, otherwise I do it by heart. Uh, nah, these are still these ones. Ah, yeah, here they are. Um, and I want to make a little bridge also to um, the discussion that we will have later in the panel. 
Um, because the movement against LGBTI rights is not only about LGBTI people, it's the same movement that's also attacking women's rights. I'm often um, advocating for um, access to safe abortion at the UN. Um, it's also the same movement that is um, um, communicating a traditional and family-based agenda. And this movement is quite big. It's transnational and it's hiding in plain sight. And I mean by that, um, we know they are there. Uh, when I started this work five years ago, I knew there were some you know, uh, conservatives that are against abortion. Um, I knew there are, um, in the Netherlands, of course, um, Christian organizations um, fighting LGBTI rights. But I didn't know they were that well organized. And actually, they are hiding in plain sight. We um, just have to see it, and especially the general public or politicians, even in the Netherlands, need to see it. And that's because it's not only far away, it's not only not our business. Um, this year, I think most of you have read the news uh, about the anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda, um, and already recently um, a few people have been charged, but um, most of all, uh, the level of violence is increasing um, on a big scale because of validating uh, this um, anti-movement. Um, and this not, didn't came about like naturally or organically. Um, it was not only based in Uganda. It was actually orchestrated by um, the uh, U.S. Christian right um, that is behind several anti-gay um, bills that have been proposed in Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, and several other um, uh, countries in Africa. And you see the, the nice group of people over here talking to the uh, First Lady of Uganda. Um, they are mostly uh, US missionaries from um, the Church of Latter-day Saints, I think it's called. Um, Mormons, we call them often in the Netherlands. Um, but um, there's even a Dutch guy on this picture here. Um, and they organized um, the Interparliamentary Forum, uh, so they invited parliamentarians from all over East Africa um, to listen to their agenda um, and to advocate to them uh, about these anti-gay bills. And they don't only advocate against LGBTI rights, they also are um, very aggressive towards sexuality education, towards anything women's rights or um, anything gender. Um, and a year earlier, they already um, proposed uh, similar um, policies across Eastern Africa to uh, stop progress on sexuality education. So they have an agenda um, in this region. But they used to be, so the, for example, the lady in the middle, she used to be someone like me. She was just visiting the basement of the UN, advocating, putting dots and commas in text to prevent abortion access. But now she has all presidential friends in, in Africa. And she can do so not because she's alone, because she has a big, big uh, bunch of money. And I talked already about the Dutch guy. Um, so in the spring of this year, uh, my organization, but also in general sexuality education in the Netherlands, saw a big attack. Um, it was all over the media, um, uh, false information about um, what children would be teached in schools. Um, and I won't repeat that information because I don't repeat myths. Um, but yeah, um, several of my colleagues received uh, threats to their door, uh, threats to their social media accounts. Um, and it was really, um, it took us 24 hours a day to uh, respond to misinformation, to um, um, ensure that parents that are concerned about sexuality education, that they received the proper scientific information. And we were a little bit um, surprised. We, each year we have like a lot of um, uh, questions on the phone when we have our yearly project week, but this year it was massive. And it was not only uh, the Christian right, it was also um, uh, uh, Muslim organizations, it was wellness influencers, all kinds of groups came together to fight for them uh, to protect their children. Uh, that's what they say. Um, but um, yeah, it was quite well orchestrated. And that's because of this same group of people. This is a transnational, uh, cross-regional uh, movement 
um, combined of, uh, yeah, again, U.S. Christian right, but also European uh, Catholic organizations, pseudo-Catholics, um, and other anti-rights um, movements. But also, for example, very, very big uh, funders. Um, I know now if you just locked your bike with an AXA slot, um, uh, that's, for example, the company that um, spends a lot of money uh, to these uh, movements. And also in the Netherlands, the guy on the right um, is one of the sponsors of a political party that didn't become that big in uh, the recent elections forum for democracy, uh, but was also uh, behind like the attack on uh, sexuality education in the Netherlands. Um, so yeah, sometimes they, they frequent the UN building um, to fight against um, safe abortion or LGBTI rights, and sometimes they meet their presidential friends. For example, at the UN, they have like almost half, um, half a billion um, dollars to spend to um, bring together um, Af African ambassadors to bring them to a retreat um, and train them in doing UN um, advocacy or train them in where to put the dots in the comments to prevent progress in your, on human rights. Um, and I have the feeling that when I work on um, um, monitoring of the opposition, monitoring of these uh, movements, uh, you can become a bit depressed um, and uh, you have to do a lot of self-care uh, in this job um, or if you're part of the movement. And uh, there's always a few things that I attach to to stay positive. Um, and that's, for example, um, the, the countries where we see progress, um, and sometimes these are small examples, but sometimes when I do account, when I count the statistics, we're still on the right track, and that's why the opposition is so aggressive. Um, one good example is, for example, the, the green wave in Latin America. You know more about the, that um, than me, um, but it was really from the grassroots. It took 10 years to build that whole movement, um, but after it became more mainstream and popular figures attached themselves to that movement, um, they were really um, uh, successful in um, ensuring abortion access in Latin America and decriminalization. Um, and one of the, the success factors was also breaking apart stigma um, and also raising awareness about the very issues, unpacking the themes, um, explaining exactly what is happening when women, for example, die after an unsafe abortion. And for example, for advocates uh, like me or people working for NGOs, it's very important to really stay true to your cause, to have your own agenda on the horizon, even though when you find consensus in the middle, uh, you have to have a vision uh, above that. Um, and I think it's important um, when you are safe, enough uh, to speak about this anti-rights movement um, and that's not for all of us the case so sometimes we have to speak for people because they are not in a safe place um, and i think it's important uh, because we have a little bit of a communications crisis um, uh, the recent elections in the netherlands saw that as well that uh, the progressives don't win because we don't uh, we are not um, i don't know um, smart enough in our communication and I think we really need to evoke empathy. Uh, we need to use pathos in our uh, communication. And um, of course, we know that we um, advocate or campaign uh, evidence-based, but that evidence doesn't really um, um, yeah, gather the, enough votes. Um, and then I think for, um, it's important to be pragmatic. Sometimes the very, very small wins, like the commas in a UN text, uh, are difficult to celebrate, but they are um, uh, progress. So we need to be able to um, reach consensus, uh, to work on sometimes with the enemy in order to ensure progress. And then decolonization, I think, is also very important. Um, the anti-rights movement, um, often argues that the uh, rights movement, so for example, the uh, women's rights movement, is uh, colonizing African states uh, with their Western agenda. And actually, um, you could say that we are both neocolonist, uh, but I think um, if we would listen to civil society organizations and activists in countries, you know that often the um, the criminal laws are based from colonial era, and um, these are actually uh, the conservative part and what was 
before that, um, before colonization, wasn't um, as conservative as we see now. Um, and then for the for the diplomats um, in the room, um, I think that it's time for, especially also the Netherlands, but other European states, for example, is to show more self-reflection. Because sometimes we are just too arrogant about our well-doing um, to build bridges or to uh, find a middle ground. And um, that requires a skill and it requires also intersectionality. Mm, and then also unpacking the very the very themes because um, speaking I'm a, a big um, um, fan of Jargon. That's why I work at uh, sometimes in a UN ba basement, um, but it also um, hinders progress if you don't unpack themes, if you don't explain what it matters to people um, um, facing very issues. So yeah, for me, a way forward is um, uh, not falling into the trap of misinformation and act actively um, fighting it. Um, also, um, uh, not taking any um, uh, human rights, but also any achievement for granted. You can still lose it. Um, we might still see it in the Netherlands. I don't hope so, but um, what we have, we can lose. Um, and it's important to do the nerdy work, do the nitty-gritty work, um, uh, put the right dots and commas in texts, um, do the activism on the street, because beca by making it mainstream, uh, we can ensure progress. And what's not your business can very quickly become your business. So that's a little bit in short before we go into group discussions. Thank you so much, Evi. It was, as you said, uh, something that we can talk about later. You put, touched upon a lot of different things that we will talk about later. But before we do that and upon the discussion, I want to have uh, a special guest from Armenia. Uh, I mean, we, we talked already a little bit about the, the Caucasus. Shonda gave us a little bit of, of the insight. But it's always really nice and really special to have this opportunity of actually listening and meeting people that are from the region and work on the region every single day. So please give it, give, uh, give her a, a round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm Ripa. I'm from uh, Armenia. Uh, I'm here uh, as a, and I represent Pink, Pink Armenia, which is an LGBTQ plus uh, organization working in Armenia, and uh, we uh, operate in Armenia since 2007. Uh, we, we are, as I said, we are an LGBTQ plus organization, so. Uh, we basically know what's going on regarding the human rights of LGBTQ plus people in Armenia. We work in um, three main direction. We provide uh, social support, we provide uh, legal support and psychological support. We do uh, ca capacity building activities. We provide spaces not only in uh, city, uh, in uh, um, Yerevan, which is the uh, capital city, but also in the regions of the of Armenia, and uh, we do advocacy work as well. We are engaged in many activities regarding the uh, um, improvement uh, of life of LGBTQ plus people in the law in the country, uh, and uh, we also uh, work with the society members. Uh, we try to influence the attitudes towards an LGBTQ plus people, queer people in the country, and uh, uh, as you mentioned, we also try to um, uh, create the, um, uh, the new narratives that are not based on the uh, misinformation, leading information, and manipulations. So, uh, what about the situation of LGBTQ plus people in the country? Uh, uh, the homosexuality was decriminalized in the country in uh, 2003, so only 20 years we have uh, this uh, situation. And uh, since that, not too much have been done. We don't have a comprehensive law that would uh, protect uh, queer people. We don't have an anti-discrimination law in the country. 
country. We don't have any kind of um, protection. We don't have legal gender recognition. So transgender people face a lot of discrimination. And because of the uh, fact of being uh, part of the community, a lot of people are uh, being uh, outcast of the social life. They've been, they have to leave their uh, University schools, we have cases when even the uh, management of the school would suggest uh, parents to uh, get out their child from the school because the other parents would have some concerns of the, because of the sexuality or gender um, identity of our children. Um, we, we don't have... Uh, an, um, uh, we, don't, we, we have the situation that, in, in gen, generally, uh, society has very uh, discriminatory attitudes towards uh, queer people, and recent uh, study shows that a uh, huge, huge amount of people would not even like to have a queer people as their uh, neighbors, um, and like. Uh, 91% uh, of people uh, said that they would prefer not to have a queer people as their neighbor, not to do business with the queer homosexual uh, men or women. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this shows how uh, generally people uh, approach the issue. And uh, in, in Armenia, uh, uh, sexuality is quite a taboo topic. And uh, we are not even talking about queer people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these attitudes are very, very common in uh, law enforcement forces as well. So when uh, queer people are being abused uh, and they face a lot of discrimination and violence, uh, they t uh, tend to not apply for the protection because they face the exact same uh, attitudes uh, there as well. And we have a situation that the cases, uh, a few, few, very few cases that we have uh, are not being um, um, properly uh, studied, are not being properly uh, examined. And we have the situation that where basically queer people don't have any kind of protection by the state members as well. Um, regarding the um, rise of uh, anti-gender movement or, or, or the anti-rights movement, um, recently, recent three years, we had the cases when the um, uh, when a transgender woman would, was killed in her apartment, uh, when and uh, we now we learned that the case is being not it's not being properly examined and uh, the um, overall the uh, public and the state does not pay. Uh, enough attention to the issue. Uh, we've learned that um, also we have cases when uh, police officers would uh, um, um, come to the clubs uh, when basically, uh, when it's mostly known that queer people would um, have some parties and that they would uh, take these people away and they would uh, examine them and they would uh, um, again, be um, very disrespectful, and only because those people uh, look different and associated with the community members, and we know that those police officer, officers haven't received any consequences, and they are still in the police forces. Um, uh, and again, unfortunately, we see that the state members and state is not uh, willing to uh, anyhow uh, pay attention to the situation of the community members. And because uh, the recent events that we had in Armenia, which uh, happened in 2020, uh, the COVID, and after that we had a war, and after that we had a 
uh, escalation uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and after that we have the force, forcefully displaced people from Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. More than 100,000 and more people came to Armenia. Uh, because of this situation, uh, it seems like the humanitarian uh, aids are being prioritized than the human rights situation of the people. And although we see that a huge uh, problem we have with the discrimination and the, the, there is a urgent need to adopt a law that would protect people from the discrimination, we see that uh, this is not happening in the country. And it seems like the uh, um, more um, um, uh, the priorities are towards the uh, uh, let's say um, humanitarian aid towards the need to, of uh, providing help to the people who uh, who lost their homes and don't uh, know what to do and of course we know that there are a queer community who also came to Armenia but because the um, society in Nagorno-Karabakh was more closed than in Armenia. Those people face uh, um, threat of being outed to their family members. And in this case, we know that, the, uh, that we will have the increase in domestic violence, unfortunately. Yeah, and we know that uh, a lot of uh, queer young people are afraid to uh, talk about their sexual or, uh, orientation, gender ident identity. So <clears throat> this is <laughs> what we have now. What is the situation in Armenia? Um, the, the, we hope that in the future, with some changes, with the help of our in international um, uh, parties, international uh, organizations, the country and state would uh, finally adopt some measures and some laws that would protect uh, people and that would also include uh, queer people. Uh, but um, it will take time uh, and uh, we, we will see the change, I think, um, in, in, in not in in, in near, nearest future, but uh, the work is being done, and with the help of uh, people who do care, uh, I think we will have some success. <laughs> Hopefully, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Riga. It was very insightful for sure as well. Now I invite all of the speakers to accompany me uh, here in the stage for a short panel discussion. We unfortunately don't have that much time anymore, um, but I'm sure we will do like a nice discussion before we have to end it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of topics that we have uh, touched upon, um, especially as you can see, the main topic is democratic erosion and the role of LGBTQI+, and women's rights in this democratic erosion. And as Evie has, has portrayed, or all of them are, have portrayed, it's not looking very up, uh, unfortunately. Um, which is a little bit ironic because we are now in, here in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is supposed to be the country with uh, the best uh, LGBTQ rights protection, and women's rights protection uh, in the world. And as Ivan has, has touched upon as well, they also contribute a lot uh, in the foreign service. Uh, they give a lot of grants as well. Um, so yeah, um, I just wanted to ask you, maybe, do you see the possibility of like the situation improving, not only in Latin America, but also in, in Europe in the coming future? I mean, we have talked about what what is wrong, but maybe how can we improve it, and how long would it take to have like a like a noticeable improvement? So if anyone can want to add something to it as well, maybe we can start with Evie. <laughs> yeah. um, well, of course, we see, for example, in Poland, it's slowly going into the right uh, direction again. So um, never say no. <laughs> yep. um, and also for the Netherlands, I'm not sure um, how far it will get, but every bit 
that you go into the wrong direction, you lose a bit of your democracy. Yeah. Um, so I think we need, to, um, yeah, we need to be louder in protecting it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, we have see, we twenty twenty four is going to be a, like a huge election year, mm -hmm. so maybe that's one of one one way of maybe seeing the light uh, in the end of the tunnel. Maybe, what do you say? <clears throat> well, um, you know, I live in the Netherlands for nine years. And uh, when I just moved, I was working for, again, like for, uh, on, um, on a different region. And I was like oh, always quite, you know, uh, fascinated uh, by the fact that people take so many freedoms and rights as granted. And whenever we would campaign on, uh, you know, any other country, I was always like, we really do have to do it here because I don't see my neighbors really communicating or even considering um, that this is a privilege, you know? Mm -hmm. And what ha whatever happened uh, these few last weeks yeah. in the Netherlands was very traumatic, I think, also for the LGBT community in the country, because we all have heard statements and um, seen uh, uh, the person uh, shaking hands with the biggest uh, opponents of the, of the movement um, internationally. Uh, but I also do hope that a rule of law will prevail. We are still in, in, in live, we are in a democratic country. <laughs> um, and I think the civil society should do met, uh, better work of a watchdog mm -hmm. by monitoring and seeing and building country narratives. And, you know, I, I do once a month um, cook uh, for uh, men, uh, like for lonely people in my neighborhood. And just a week, uh, that very week, I was, it was my turn to go to the community center and do the dessert. I was baking uh, apple, <laughs> apple tart with um, young voters, um, people of color, two of them, and they were like, yes, yeah, we did vote this way, uh, why not? Uh, we all wait for like social housing for seven years and uh, you know, uh, he's right. And I was like, how, how come he's right? Because all these people are coming and taking my jobs and everything, you know, that's very, very popular narrative. And I was like, okay, do you know what did it cost me to come here? What is the criteria and how many actually of those who want to get here? Uh, we had a very long discussion and then they asked me, uh, what did I want? And I told them what I did vote. And they had even no idea of existence of this party. <laughs> and they went checking in on, you know, um, what is it all about and everything. And, they, and in the end, we had a conversation about how very same message um, must should have been communicated differently. And that the root causes is not those very few little others that are coming, uh, many of them coming from the... Uh, war in Ukraine, and Ukraine is doing actually a great job for all of us, because when it will fail, or in case it fails, anyone else can be next in another eight years. We have seen this tendency even ever since Georgia and invasion, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so communication and talking to people. I think you had this, and you're also slight, uh, talking to your neighbors and uh, campaigning on the streets. This is what we miss. Yeah, maybe it's also, of course, um, people seek for a scapegoat. Uh, so when there's instability, be it a housing market, be it economic instability, COVID, um, people seek someone to blame it to. And that's not only immigrants, it's also um, people that for them are not part of their traditional story. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with, with the things that have been said. I, I guess uh, to answer to your question, I will try to maintain my natural optimism. <laughs> um, and, and, and to touch upon, maybe build up on some of the things that you put in your presentation, which is um, we need to figure it out that we need to work, we must work in intersectionality because at the end of the day, they are just putting the same box, you know, different minority of different groups, and, and a very easy narrative of attack um, is being successful. And, and to your point as well, we need to figure it out that there is a, a, 
a different way to communicate our ideas or explain what democracy is or how it works because with um, really fancy messages, with um, just talking about rights as a, something that is difficult to understand or to grasp, there's something that we're not doing right because just by your explanation, people who are actually going to be affected by these policies are voting for these people who are supporting these autocrats. Um, so I, I'm, I, I will respond with a maybe positive um, response that I've been strongly working hand by hand with uh, women's rights back home, also the youth, and the youth is also shaping and, 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 and let's say, individually shaping in our different areas. In the case of Panama, for example, we're closely working with the young Afro-descendants. And the Afro-descendants have been a, a group that Panama has been very conservative because it's, it's, it's a movement that is very uh, related to the Episcopal Church. So the, 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 the human rights defenders of the older generation are not so keen to work in issues like abortion or LGBT rights, but the youth are, and the youth are changing from the inside of that movement, that, that way working in intersectionality and open up the conversations. So we need the Afro-descendants, we, we need the women, we need to work with the different um, groups in the LGBT community in a unified way, or at least a strategic way to stop these erosions uh, on our democracies that are actually part of a very populist and easy to copy and paste uh, thing. One thing that I worked heavily in, in the past two years was monitoring misinformation, and you also touched upon. And the misinformation, um, at least in Latin America in the past decade, came uh, basically in three ways. One was the gender ideology thing. I guess all of you have heard of it. And how successful what those lies were um, in, in terms of mo mobilized uh, f uh, families and conservative groups with the, with the lie that, you know, um, gender as, as, as a concept was just to deform society when it was just to actually help women to have a decent life and, and, and other parts of the gender, like, uh, includes the, the LGBT community. And, and things that also were not successful, for example, there was a huge investment for conservative groups, lots of money thrown in to Latin America to, um, to go with the MAP, M-I-P in Spanish, which is the, the, the pedophiles movement. And how through misinformation say that, you know, pedophilia is a sexual orientation, therefore if we work for sexual orientation, then we're advocating for pedophilia, so we're gonna you know, mess up with the kids, and then we're gonna destroy families and, and ruin the world. That actually was not successful. Why? Because we uh, work in coalitions, different countries. So this, was start, this study was started in Colombia, I was helping from Panama, we monitored from Brazil and Mexico, and we saw the trend, we saw that they were copy and paste. We know where they came from, it came from Europe, and then from Europe to Honduras, and Honduras started spreading out. So we, we, if only working in intersectionality, only working in coalitions um, was a way to stop that, that it in the past had been no horrible for for the LGBT community, and 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 that um, the same was uh, and still is with hate speech and electoral misinformation. So we know how sensitive elections are. So we need to be prepared before elections. That's why I'm going back home. <laughs> elections in 2024. It's going to be a challenging moment, but this is when the fears come up, the scapegoats come on, you know, and they and this. Uh, populist very um, with a, like not so much narratives to to say what is the, the type of government or democracy they want to be ruling for, but the easy scapegoats kind of fear mongering um, that has been helping not only in Europe but in Latin America. We have the case of Bolsonaro in Brazil. Mm. Well, we know about no, Trump, Argentina, uh, Argentina with Milley. Um, so if we know this trend, if we know how to operate, we need to, you say, change our way to work and respond to these attacks. Yeah, definitely. I mean, 
as you were, as all of you touched a little bit upon, like you, you have mapped who these transnational conser conservative networks are. So if you already know who they are, how are your organizations trying to like defend LGBT, but also women's rights in the face of this common threat that we're facing? So I don't know, um, how can you, or what, what, what is, for example, COC, COC doing? What is Fundación Igual is doing? What is uh, Rutgers doing? How are you forming this um, international bridges and, and, and interlinks of, of different organizations? How are you doing it? Yeah, so one thing indeed is to invest in movement building. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the first case that I showed was the anti-gay bill in, in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing also with the help of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs now um, is ensuring that the movements have the finances, have the capacity to join forces. Um, and then one thing, for example, um, one track in, in our office is dealing with opposition. And uh, part of that is, for example, um, ensuring that we have winning narrative. Mm. Um, so also, for example, reframing um, the way uh, we talk about our issues. Um, uh, I can explain, for example, you have uh, the right to abortion, but it's far more um, close to people when you talk about access to abortion care, because actually healthcare personnel caring for you. Okay, I go next then. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's easy, you know, our theory of change is built in intersectionality and uh, cooperation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do have also high hopes on uh, recently developed feminine foreign policy at the conference that maybe you were also attending. Um, yeah, well, you know, it is rather, uh, rather a new chapter to explore jointly together with uh, our foreign missions mm. and to understand how uh, can we make uh, our foreign policy more inclusive towards all women and girls in all their diversities. Luckily, they do have also in that um, policy mention of uh, LGBTI uh, Q plus uh, uh, persons. So, yeah, again, you know, we do have hopes on the fact that we are... Uh, democracy, a country with rule of law, and that we do uh, mm, commit to our uh, policies and our agenda, just like we do commit towards our human rights agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should find a way to ma make this policy also work. But this is quite a new development, and we will see what will happen in the coming four years. Um, but the hope is there, and uh, we will just continue cooperating. And, and another thing is also working with our missions uh, and, and embassies in, uh, in countries. Like, for example, we develop manuals uh, to assist them to understand the matter better, uh, to synthesize and to uh, make, uh, again, resources that are not available by us, uh, but via embassies and human rights mechanisms to the um, uh, small uh, organizations, but also initiative groups uh, where, where they uh, have uh, representation? Um, yeah, we're doing some stuff. And I, I think um, answering in two ways. One is in, in our advocacy efforts, we have been uh, uh, we have been working hard in the past years to kind of change our narratives and kind of offer a different like view of of our activism, um, specifically working national campaigns based on values. So we start this campaign, Si Acepto, which translates to I do in Costa Rica um, in 2016, then in Panama from 2018 till today, now in Peru, a, a different but similar in Guatemala, and want to start soon in Bolivia. And it's basically uh, testing, like actually testing, like scientific testing, what are the values correlated to marriage or to, to, to the love of couples. And once we, we map that in, in the country, we build a, a campaign based on those values. So in, in the case of Panama, because the one that I work the most is 
the values are respect, family, and treat all like you want to be treated. So the golden rule. And, and, the, and, the, and the narratives are very simple, are based on those values. It's not about human dignity, human rights, access. Like it's, it's narrowing down to the basics to show to other people or to create empathy towards LGBT persons. So it, 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 it crossed that um, like long-standing narrative of rhetoric towards the universal rights and, and the dignity that is very difficult for like common people, let's put it that way, to understand and to relate to. But when you have a 60-year-old woman that looks very much like your neighbor or the person you see on the street saying, hey, I just want respect to my granddaughter and I want her to get married as I had the right when it was her age, period. That is what we call hearts and minds, to change hearts and minds. And it's like trying to, you know, strategically lower down our communications to make it more, more um, easy to understand and create empathy. Um, and the success of that to kind of end, end on a positive note, for example, when, when we started the campaign, we, we did some research and we were around 80, 86% of opposition to marriage. After three years of consistent work, we decreased that to almost 54%. So almost 20 something points of a negative perspective to a positive perspective in just three years is remarkable. Uh, in a country of four, 4 million people, to change 300,000 people from negative to positive is just a way to have a more, more profound or, or sustainable change. Um, and, and also in the parts of maybe the lobbying and the policy or the politics, uh, I think that have been very successful uh, has been to use the international community, um, especially the Corals Coalition, lead by uh, most of the time by, by the King of the Netherlands uh, and the US, Canada and other countries, the UK. Um, and why? Because to, to, to avoid the, well, you touched on that and also, also you and the, and the colonization of like the, the imposing Western views, at least in the Equal Rights Coalition, if we have the power of those countries who have very strong you know, international policy towards defending LGBT rights, but also like local partners like Argentina, Costa Rica, um, Colombia. So that, that you know, foreign Western imposition is no longer, uh, successful because you have a fellow Latin American country also joining uh, the conversation and the narrative of what is important to respect the rights of lesbian, gays, and, and, and transgender. So there, there are ways, uh, I guess, unfortunately, because of that polarization that we have today, the misinformation that we have to, to deal with, the amount of money that is flowing, and I don't, want, I don't know when I have time to talk about that, but that's another issue that is flowed into these conservative groups, they actually have impact. Mm -hmm. So we need to think outside of the box, find new ways to cooperate, find new ways to create narrative, and maybe, um, uh, you know, it's part of this um, training that I, that I was exposed to studying public policy, but unlikely coalitions. To build unlikely coalitions, because they are building plenty of like coalitions, for example, the Catholic Church now is best friend with the evangelicals when they were you know opposite enemies for centuries now they're best friends because they have a common interest to avoid women to get an abortion and to avoid LGBT people to have their rights, like the right to marriage. So if they make these unlikely coalitions, we need to make on our unlikely coalitions as well. Yeah, for example, three tactics that the anti-rights movement has that I find very difficult to counter is um, them indoctrinizing youth. Mm. Um, yes. So what we also saw in the Netherlands, there was one poll done under young people, what they would vote for, and they would 
um, a majority would vote for an undemocratic party. Um, they're weaponizing the active citizen. So, for example, when there's, um, um, yeah, the, for example, the attack on sexuality education, it went viral uh, because of all the active citizens that, um, yeah, have organized themselves, especially in the Netherlands, for example, after COVID and after uh, all other kinds of protests. And this, this group is continuing to, to find um, each other. Um, and, and another tactic is misleading women with, for example, false information. And that can be um, natural ways of uh, family planning. Uh, so uh, there's whole communities on menstrual apps um, um, that are attacking like uh, contraception, for example. Um, yeah, so we see, for example, in the Netherlands also, um, where we used to be the country with the lowest amount of abortions, now we suddenly have a, a higher number. We don't know yet um, what the cause for that is. Um, it's not only, um, for example, uh, abortions from uh, people from Poland coming to the Netherlands, um, but misinformation can be one of the, the reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we haven't touched upon it a little bit too much, but as Ivan was saying, we know that a huge amounts of money are flowing from certain conservative parts, maybe Catholic Church, maybe in Latin America a little bit more, the evangelicals. Um, so how, how can you, or how can the civil society and academia as well, because we, we can't forget the role that universities and think tanks as well have in contracting these. Um, and maybe you, you touched about it a little bit on re regarding misinformation as well, um, but how can uh, like civil society as well um, counteract these movements that are, ha have lots of amount of money, but maybe don't have that many people, but since they have so much money, they can just create misinformation campaigns. Yeah, yeah I think it's important to out them. Um, and uh, we need research for that. Mm. So there have been several reports um, um, tracking the money. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in, in Europe between 2009 and 2018, that was 700 million. Um, and that was only the tip of the iceberg. Um, and the top funders were uh, European Catholics in coalition with other uh, Christian organizations, uh, Russian oligarchs, and uh, the US Christian right funding European anti-rights movements. Mm. Um, and uh, using laundromat systems, so uh, funding from um, you know, Russian oligarchs, going to all kinds of small foundations in Europe um, that can be tracked back to different uh, conservative parties winning in different European countries. So there's a whole yeah, um, system, so to uh, say, uh, behind it, and we need to um, yeah, be transparent about that. Unfortunately, that's sometimes only in the small media, like in the um, investigative journalism, mm -hmm. um, you find these, this information and hardly reaches uh, uh, NOS, let's say that way. Um, and uh, yeah, also out uh, the big brands and the um, economic elites in Europe that are behind this movement. So what I said about the AXA, um, um, key, uh, but also Fiat cars, uh, Geox shoes, um, these are just very rich people that are funding the, the movement. Agreed, out them and, and research. Um, I, I was ad, uh, conducting uh, research on conversion practices in Latin America um, last year to finish my degree. And I found very interesting um, an open democracy investigation um, on the link on conversion practices in different countries in Latin America that were funded by this uh, U.S. conservative groups like Focus on Family and Exodus Global. So they basically have this actually legal institutions or organizations in the U.S. So they're legally, legally registered mm -hmm. and they have like everything in, 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 in check, let's put it that way. But they are using these organizations to send money and um, to, to countries like, Costa, for example, Costa Rica and Guatemala and um, thanks to investigative journalism um, in open democracy, this um, um, uh, he, this journalist like have to pass through like LGBT people looking for help, like psychological, psychiatric help, 
and finding that once they offer the services, they were actually inducting them to have conversion practices. And these were, and this is the sad part, even like register, they were registered um, psychologists and psychiatrists. Of course, there was an open investigation and some of them were even like um, banned from practice in, in Costa Rica, not so much in Guatemala, the, the investigation didn't went through, um, not in the US because they, they used this masquerade of like doing, um, they, they wouldn't do it anything. But this is one simple example of how one single organization was causing so much harm in, in different countries in Central America. Um, and, and you see how, and this is from my own experience, how even a small number of organizations, like there are like four or five people only, but they have so much like resources to you know, print stuff, to create um, events, to invite people to retreats. It's like hard to like, we're like four people in my organization. Like I barely have that, you know, that capacity of like, of course, we outnumber them in like civil, like civil society participation and kind of social media and all that jazz. But unfortunately, in, in a capitalist society, you know, the money gets you somewhere. And if this even, four people receive half a million dollar per year, how am I going to compete with a budget of 100,000? So it, it's, it's, it's hard, but as you said, you know, maybe it's, it's an open call to academia um, to, to focus on, on this, doing the research, finding, tracking the money. Who, like like who, who are these people behind? Who are these families? Who are, who are putting money to destroy the life of women, for example. Let's out them, and, and they, they, they should be accountable of, of the, 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 the sadness that they were creating in, in different parts of the world. Perhaps also the difference is that's unrestricted funding. We also get funding, yeah. but it's very restricted. Exactly. We have to yeah, fill in very, very uh, many forms and um, write reports to justify for small projects. Yeah, exactly. I very much agree, uh, especially with funding point. It's uh, uh, very challenging also for us. We, we will see what will happen. But I um, just to add up on uh, what has been said, I think that we also need to learn uh, challenging ourselves because usually when with civil society, you um, design whatever campaign, the target uh, area is a gray zone. So basically people that are in between, they do not have a specific opinion. Uh, while the strategies should change and we really should target majority. And I think that the generation gap in, in, in transferring knowledge and also in, uh, con in media consumption habits should, should be met. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think we are losing greatly at this point to TikTok. And uh, I don't know many people of my generation or of my bubble mm. uh, using it. And this is a huge mistake. So uh, get to know your enemy <laughs> and set targets, I would say. Yeah, I mean, this is something that is also closely related to like the erosion of democratic principles, populism, the, I mean, the rise of populism, and also common threats that we're facing in Europe and in Latin America as someone who is from both uh, regions as well, it's always easy to see the parallels that we see in Latin America with like election of, we, we call it caudillos, like politicians that don't have an ideology, but also like are portraying themselves as this powerful politician. And also here in Europe, with what happened with builders as well here in, in, in the Netherlands, but it used to happen in, in Poland as well, with, ha with happening in, in Eastern Europe in some places as well, but also in France and Germany. Um, so it's like this, this common threat of we're losing democracy to like few people that are, can speak really loud and have massive amounts of funding. Um, so yeah, so maybe uh, before, before ending, ending this, we can maybe get some, some questions from, from the crowd as well, if, if some questions are, are there. So you can also uh, respond to, to the comments as well. Yes, in the back. <laughs> no, we need the microphone for the live stream. Sorry. 
Thanks. Um, so, Afi, you said at one point, uh, we're still on the right track, but that's why the opposition is so aggressive. And I was wondering whether, um, what you exactly meant by this, like, does this mean that um, they're feeling this transition incoming? Or does this mean that this will remain, this opposition? Um, and I don't know, are we progressing towards an end goal, so to say? I don't know, do you get what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, so I think it's, it's, for example, if you look over the past 10 or 20 years, the amount of countries that have decriminalized abortion, that have decriminalized same-sex um same-sex sex, yeah. Um, um, that is really growing. And uh, so globally speaking, uh, we are winning. Um, also in, in just recent years, we've saw, seen some great examples in countries with progressive laws. Um, so I think that's why they seek uh, the Achilles heel. What is it called that way? Yeah. Uh, they seek like the countries where they can still have an influence. Um, and they won't focus, for example, on the ne Netherlands per se, um, but uh, countries like Uganda, Kenya, um, Latin America countries, countries where social security is, um, is shrinking. Um, I think those countries are, are volatile. Yeah. Thank you so much, first of all, for um really sketching a global picture of things that are going on. Um, I have two questions, but let, let's stick to one. Maybe because I know that at least two of you there over there are lawyers. And what I found interesting about, let's say, the, the combination of both of your stories, you were talking about, I think, the, the uh, necessity of loving details, which is basically what the law is about. Now, if I were a conservative Catholic person, somebody would, for example, tell me how I could change the school regulations in order to prevent uh, some books for the library, you know. But if I'm a liberal, nobody's going to tell me what to do to ensure that this is never going to happen to my school. So I was, I was wondering whether, if it were up to you, we, there should be there, there shouldn't be some kind of like hands-on detail loving uh a kind of like like a le legal coaching or something for all those people who want to protect those rights not so much on the national level but rather on the level of institutions like hospitals schools like all these daily life institutions that are under pressure everywhere in every country i would say very sharp point indeed, um, because it's not only at the UN where Russia, for example, is the smartest in the procedures um, and um, the, we call it like-minded governments, um, are too late in, in fighting that. Um, it's also indeed at the local level. We've seen, for example, a municipality in the Netherlands where um, I think they wanted to prevent uh, gender information in schools or something like that. Um, so indeed, we need to be working um, on the nitty-gritty at the lowest level. Uh, and coaching, I have no idea how to do that. But I'm, I'm happy that there's organizations solely focusing on litigation on, um, yeah, on this, uh, this fight. Yeah, yeah and, and also to your point, I guess, maybe an answer could be just going back to more you know, spaces for civic participation and, and, and training people on what that uh, is. One thing that we have seen, for example, in, in Panama, to, to your point, is that uh, two, two um, governments, like ago, like past two governments, they took out um, some specific uh, um, courses in high school. And one was uh, uh, like uh, civil participation. It was was just a, like a boring, um, you know, lecture that nobody cared about it. And we saw now with the next generation that these kids are leaving high school and they don't even know what are their basic rights. And you, and this is going to our, our uh, also to your 
of both of, of your interventions that we, we can't take our rights for granted. And that's what we have seen in, in, the, in the past years. I, I guess the most brutal example is abortion rights in the United States. You know, nobody thought, I have never remotely thought there was going to be a situation and see the horror that we're seeing. You know, women had it, have to, you know, go for miles from one state to another to seek an abortion or, die, or, or face dying in the United States of America in 2023. So I guess it's easy to, to make people forget and also to preclude people to know what their rights are. And, and I guess to a moment of hope, I, I have had the chance to work in different parts of, of, of the Americas, but mostly in Central America. And I was very um, surprised many years ago of listening to indigenous people in Guatemala, for example. And they were extremely versed on the Inter-American Declaration of, of Human Rights. Like, most of my friends not even know what the Article 1 or Article 2 or Article 3 refers to. And these, especially women, were really, really clear on that. And that was by um, community empowerment. And these were organizations that dedicated only to, te to teach, especially on impoverished women uh, or like people with less, let's say, level of education, at least what are those basics, right? You know, the, your right to mobilization. Nobody can stop you. Nobody can take your passport. These may be small things that also create a more enforced citizen. Therefore, maybe that you create a more um, interest on in political participation and not just like waking up the day before election and then not even knowing who's going to vote. I don't know if I respond to that, but that's what my, my course of thinking after listening to your question. Last question, maybe? I think we unfortunately don't have any more time for formal questions. We obviously, after I wrap up the event, we can stay here for a little bit longer talking and you can ask the questions personally. Um, but yeah, wrapping up the event, because unfortunately we don't have any more time. Um, I just wanted to like gather everything that have been said here. Obviously, we're living in, in a situation that is maybe unparalleled or we haven't seen in the last couple of, of decades as well, with a lot of countries slipping to autocracy, um, democracy being, being um, questioned, but also a lot of people like not feeling democracy, not feeling um, democracy at their, at their core. So maybe this, this, this is an opportunity for civil society to grow and to like, empower themselves and like, actually feel that human rights is something that you have to fight every single day for the human rights and not something, as Ivan said, just like day after, before the election, go and uh, go, go to vote without knowing who's, who are the candidates. So that's maybe the picture that I want to paint in a, a maybe positive light for the future as well. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for participating in this event. Thank you for the questions as well. And thank you all for for your uh, participation, for your incredible insight into the topic. I know it's maybe uh, would have been better a little bit longer and more in depth, but I mean, thank you so much for coming and thank you all for, for coming to the event as well.